today. It is still spring break. Some of our folks are back and some others are gone, but we're glad you're here today. It makes it very special. It is our 52nd uh, wedding anniversary today, and uh, it was a cold, rainy Friday evening on March 18, 1966, and uh, so we went to our little apartment and had a bologna sandwich after the, after the wedding. That was big money back then. But I'm thankful and uh, we're blessed and thank you for your comments and concerns. Once they just a word to uh, Kathy Loftus and Donnie and the passing of Betty Allen. I've known Betty and author her husband for many years and they're two lovely Christian people, hard workers in the church, very dedicated workers in the church in the Franklin, Kentucky area. So I know that author is lost and Kathy I lost a very dear one in their family and we extend our assembly indeed to them and the loss of Betty Allen and it is um, good to have Sister Pat Dillon back with us this morning she spent several days in the hospital and I don't, I don't think we had mentioned that but we're glad that Pat's able to be back well the sermon this morning is titled some advice from uh, for husbands and wives from the Apostle Peter. Advice from the Apostle Peter for husbands and wives. Two couples had been out to eat and they were driving back to their homes and the husbands were in the front seat and the wives were in the back seat and the man not driving, the passenger side, he said, uh, you know, sometime we need to go, there's a real good Mexican restaurant we ate at recently, my wife and I, and it's really good and we ought to go there sometime. And then one driving said, yes, I love Mexican food. Well, what's the name of it? I might have already eaten there. And the man said, oh, the name of it, the name of it. I, oh, he tried and he cried. He, it just wouldn't come to him. He said, you know that flower that's pretty and smells good and people give it for gifts and all that? And the guy said, a rose? He said, rose. He turned around and looked in the back seat and he said, rose? <laughs> What is the name of that Mexican restaurant? <laughs> well, uh, we husbands and wives do have a hard time uh, uh, communicating sometimes. We are human beings, and uh, sometimes it's hard to communicate. And if we listen to Apostle Peter, I'm sure that we would get some good advice this morning. I want to dig up an old sermon, a golden olden maybe. When I was a student at David Lipscomb University College back then, I had the opportunity to study sermon preparation under Baxter Barrett Baxter. I love Brother Baxter. He was a real true speaker and a renowned author and lecturer and part of Lipscomb's campus work. And he made the point, he said, if you want to stay somewhere a good while with the congregation, you, you cannot use old sermons. You've got to come up with new sermons. And I've tried to do that to the most of my efforts, and I've tried to do that here at Holiday. And I think that's why I was able to spend 31 years with the Sycamore Church in the pulpit. And now we are soon, we'll have finished 13 years here, hard to believe, starting in 2005. But um, I think because I do try to work up new lessons, like tonight's lesson, uh, but every once in a while you gotta go back and pull the gold and old enough. Um, and you know, some of you were not here a few years ago when I gave this lesson, so it'll be new to you. And the ones who've heard it before, you, like me, probably need to hear it again anyway. So uh, uh, bear with us in that regard. We have a lot of serious problems in our homes and families. The divorce rate is alarming. And there's a lot of folks that are married. They're not, they're not happy. They are married, and they stay married for the children's sake or religious sake or whatever, but they're not happily married. And we don't have too much time here on earth, the very best. So we need to try to make the best of it that we possibly can. And certainly that regards the things of marriage and the things of making happiness and commitment in that regard. It is a serious problem. And I think if we listen to Apostle Peter, he would help us very much. This is advice from the Apostle Peter. And there's two reasons I think that he's a good one to turn to today. Number one, he was inspired. You know, it wasn't just a man speaking. He was speaking by inspiration when he wrote First and Second Peter and concerning the home or husbands and wives that we're looking at today. 
uh, we get it from an inspired man. In John 14 and verse 26, remember the Holy Spirit was promised to guide the apostles into all the truth, and as it did Peter. And, um, and from that viewpoint, also in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, he makes reference to the inspiration beginning in verse 16 of his efforts. For we have not followed, speaking of himself and his ministry, cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from the Father glory and honor when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. He was there. He heard it on the Mount of Transfiguration. When we were with him in the Holy Mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed. Listen to me. What I'm speaking, he says, is by the authority of God, by the inspiration of God. And that you take heed. Like a light shining in a dark place as the day dawns and the day of star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter, have you been moved by the Holy Ghost to say some things to husbands and wives? Yes. So, number one, we need to listen to his advice because it's inspired. Number two, he's a married man himself. And that ought to have some merit to it, that he knows some things because he's married. How do we know that? Mark 1 and verse 30 speaks of him having a mother-in-law. And in order to have a mother-in-law, you've got to be married in most cases that I can figure out. And in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5, he spoke of the fact that uh, defending himself, Paul, the apostle Paul, when he was defending himself, that he had a right to be an apostle even though he wasn't married, and some were using that against him. He said, I could if I wanted to, just like Cephas. And that's another name for Simon <laughs> Peter. Uh, he's married, and I and some other brethren. And if I wanted to take a sister to be a wife, I could too. So Peter was a married man, and he knew of the things he was speaking about. Some knowledge, at least. Inspired, and he comes from knowledge and experience. Years ago at Sycamore, one time there was a very powerful young teenage preacher that was the talk of the counties around and everybody wanted to hear this young man he was very talented and we invited him to come over and speak at Sycamore now he's a teenager I think he was about 17, 16, 17 years old oh he could quote a lot of scripture and he had a great delivery and he shared a lesson about 10 um, uh, 10 rules for husbands and wives and of course he was not married and some folks said there's no way in the world a teenager, unmarried, can give rules for husbands and wives. I understood the point. I know the point. We all agree with it. He couldn't speak by experience. But if he spoke the scriptures, if he taught the word, then by that process, yes, we could be edified. And hopefully uh, there was some edification that took place. But Peter is inspired. Peter speaks by knowledge because he's married. Let's go and look at these uh, advices Seven verses in 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1. Likewise, any time we come across the word likewise or therefore, we know it as a concluding word or a concluding thought, a continuing thought. He's just been talking about something that he's going to say there is a likeness to it and it's concerning subjection. There's something I've been discussing. Man divided the Bible into chapters and verses. It was all written as one letter. For us to quickly turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, man did that, not God. And so when Peter was writing this, he's been writing about something about subjection earlier than the third chapter, verse 1. What could it be? Well, let's look at the second chapter in verse 13. 1 Peter 2, 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So Christians are to be in submission to the government, to be faithful Christians. As long as the government doesn't ask us to do something that's sinful or wrong, we ought to obey, obey God rather than man. Let's look at verse 18. Servants, you be subject, Christian servants, you be subject to your masters in all fear, not only to the good and the gentle one, but also to the forward ones. So Christians are to be in submission to their masters when they are servants. And then verse 21, beginning of the second chapter, 
For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. No. And when he suffered, he didn't threaten folks, but he committed himself or humbled himself to die upon the tree, as the very next verse 24 states, by his own sins, he died upon the tree. He submitted himself to the cross. So now let's go back to chapter 3 and verse 1. Like the submission of Christians to the laws of the land, like Christian servants are to be in submission to their masters, and be a good example of submission, like Christ was in submission to the cross for our sins, wives are to be in submission or subjection to their own husbands. Now, in this context, look at verse 1. He's primarily talking about obeying the gospel. By obeying the gospel, that's where the subjection of the wives is Peter's concern here in verse 1. Evidently, there were Christians, women, sisters in the first century church whose husbands were not Christians. Obviously. What Peter is saying with, saying here is, you wives, if you are in subjection to your own husbands, you need to be. And here's what I want to say about that. If they have not obeyed the gospel, if any of them have not obeyed the word, logos, the word, the gospel, they also may without the word, or the New King James says a word, they may without a word be one, W-O-N, by the conversation of the wives. Now the King James is, came out in 1611, 400 years ago. The word conversation back then did not mean talking. We talk about somebody having a conversation. Oh, we had a good conversation. We talked, we talked, we talked. That's not the way it was used originally. Originally, it was speaking about behavior. Uh, they are won over by the behavior, the conversation of the wives not by their constant talking or nagging. You're not going to force your husband into obeying the God. Probably going to push him away. But what you want to do if you want to win your husband to the Lord is let him see your subjection. Let him know that you are you have submitted yourselves unto this marriage relationship and you understand your role in the home and family is one of submission. Very important factor in regard to happiness and well-being and influencing a husband where that he might obey the gospel is through this uh, subjection, submission to the husband, like Ephesians 5 was read by Brother Bill a while ago, uh, in, in all things, wives should be in submission to their husband. And that involves the different parts of marriages, the different marriage, and the different uh, activities of marriage. There should be this humble attitude of subjection. Now, do wives have faults and feelings and talents and careers and abilities? Yes, a thousand times over. Should they be able to use those? Yes, in the home and family, as they are use their expertise and as they are an asset and a blessing. And that's not a challenge to a man's leadership uh, if his wife is simply doing and helping the family as they work together as a team, as a unity unit. But this subjection here for the wives. Uh, mainly his point is in trying to help them to teach and convert their husband. Verse 2. While, here's what the husband is doing, okay? If you are a wife in subjection, he's beholding, looking, viewing, what? Your chaste conversation. Remember, that means way of life or behavior. He's beholding your chaste conversation coupled with fear or respect. Reverence. Bill's last verse there, verse 33, said, Wives, see that you reverence your husband, King James Version, or respect your husband as the new King James Version. Uh, respect, uh, reverence your husband. You couple that to a chaste conversation. Chast or chest um, refers to God-fearing, high morals. He sees that. He knows you are a good, honest person. You try to live right. You dress right. There's an old saying by Brother Jimmy Allen. You can tell whether a woman wants to be chaste or C-H-S-E-D, chaste by other men, 
by the way she dresses, by her behavior. That's what he's beholding. That's what's going to convert him. Not the nagging, not the pushing, but it's going to be that he beholds this God-fearing behavior coupled with it respect for him as the husband and leader of the home. I tell you, you hear some women, the way they talk about their husband, sometimes even in their presence, it's just uh, so sad, so unbelievable. How can you be a team? How can you be close if there's not respect for one another as there should be in marriage? Verse 3. Who's adorning, let it be not the outward adorning. Now this is not a prohibition because he's going to talk about putting on apparel. If it's a prohibition, you would be running around naked. That's not what he's saying. Uh, you're, the adorning, he's, now remember, he's watching. He's looking at the wife. He's beholding her chaste conversation. And he's noticing that she adorns herself, but it's not outward adorning that really gets his heart, like the way she fixes her hair and plaits it with gold and silver and, and all kind of jewelry. No, 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 no. And the putting on of gold. No, 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 no. That, that doesn't hold a marriage together. Or the putting on of a big, fine, uh, expensive dress. No, no, that's not what holds a marriage together. Those things uh, continue in the next verse, verse 4. Uh, let him be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Those things are corruptible. Um, as we get older, um, certainly silver and gold and fine apparel are corruptible things. I use at this point uh, Elvis Presley as an example. Um, Elvis had the looks, he had the talent, and he had the money. But he lost his wife, Priscilla, to Mike Stone. Mike Stone was a karate teacher, and he was often in and out of their homes, teaching their home, Graceland, teaching Elvis karate moves and efforts that he used a lot in his shows. But also, he spent a lot of time with Priscilla, teaching her karate and all such. She left Elvis in some of his ways. Um, hard for a lot of people to understand, because he had so much of this world's what would be considered um, marvelous achievements, but not enough to hold a marriage together. That's not what holds a marriage together. Those outward appearances of things. Myrtle Monroe voted the most beautiful woman in the world at one time in her career, but was married and divorced five times and said, before she died, probably a suicide, she said, I've never been happily married. Never been happily married. Five times. Most beautiful in the world. See, it's, it's, let it be the man of your heart. It's not the outward. That's not what he's looking at, the outward things, that um, the corruptible things as we grow older. But the ornament. This is beautiful writing right here. Here's what you need to wear. Not gold. Not the way you fix your hair. Not the beautiful dress. But you put on the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Meek. Moses was the meekest man on the earth. Didn't mean he had... Didn't stand up for what was right or had views or concerns or knowledge. Certainly did. But it's, it's a humble attitude and a quiet spirit. Someone said this is the difference between a woman and a lady. A woman is loud and boisterous and dominant. A lady is meek and quiet and gentle. A meek and a quiet spirit. Oh, that's, that's what's going to get to his heart. As he sees her going to church... As he sees her taking the children to church, she's meek and quiet and, and, and she doesn't nag him and all these things. In the sight of God, this is great spirit and great price. What's the great price? That ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. Next verse. But after, before after this matter, he, the old time, the holy women of God trusted in God, they adorned themselves. They were in subjection, their own husbands. Even as Sarah, okay, obeyed Abraham. Abraham was the father of the faithful, to the, of the faith, to the Jewish people. Sarah, to be a daughter of Sarah was oh, one of the greatest honors. If somebody could say, oh, she just, she's a daughter of Sarah. Well, what did Sarah do? She called Abraham Lord, not capital L, not Lord and Savior, but she gave him respect. He was her husband. He's the father of their son. And... Um, Whose daughters you are, that's what I want to be. I want to be a daughter of Sarah, ladies would say. Well, as long as you do well, you work toward that attitude, and you're not afraid with any amazement. That's always been a difficult passage right there, or line. And the New King James makes it a little bit better. 
that you're not afraid with any terror. You're in submission to your husband, not because you're afraid of him, not because you think he's going to hit you, or he's going to be violent, or mean to you, and take it out some way or the other. That's, that's not the subjection he's talking about. You know, you're going to listen to me, and you're going to, I'll knock you down. No, 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 no. That's what kind of um, relationship is that? Uh, anytime a man would hit a woman, what kind of a man is that? You know, that's not what he's talking about at all. You, you, but this, uh, yeah, there it is. Thank you, uh, Josh. He's pulled up the New King James Version that says you're not afraid with any terror. So um, you're, you're not trembling. Oh, I've, I've got to be in submission or he's going to hit me. No, 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 no. But you, you respect him and you, you, you want to be a sort of daughter of Sarah and you want to be in subjection to him. Well, next verse goes to the men. Now think about it. We've got six verses for the ladies. We've got one verse for the men. What do you think about that? That's pretty good for us men, isn't it? We only got one verse. But oh, I'm telling you, there's a lot in this. It's a long verse. You can't even get it on one page. Uh, there's a lot here, okay? So wives being subjected. You want to win your husband? Let him see your chaste conversation. Let him know you're a God-fearing woman. You're a good person. Now, you're not perfect, but you, you, you love and honor and respect him, okay? Now here's, uh-oh, there's that word again, likewise again. And um, so, what do you mean, Peter? Well, like I've been talking about what wives need to do, being subjected to their husbands. Let me talk to you husbands what you need to do, likewise. You need to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Okay? What is the knowledge? that you would give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. If God has asked wives to be in submission to their husband, that is humbling themselves down to be in a role of submission, and that's not easy. It's not easy for anybody. We've all been in some cases, all of us men have been in some situations where we had to submit ourselves to our boss, our employer, um, in order to do what we were told to do or to get the job done, whatever. Uh, like I told him, you know, uh, I'm going to, whatever the one who signs this check tells me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I think that's what we understand. And it's not always easy. It's, it's a challenging demand. And for a wife to be in submission to her husband, the husband ought to be knowledgeable of that. And he ought to love her and appreciate her that she is of a meek and quiet spirit. That she is willing to be in submission to her own husband. That she's not saying, this is what you're going to do, and you're going to do it now. No, she is in submission to the leadership of the home. So a husband who's wise, who is smart, he will live with this wife according to the knowledge that God's asked her to be in submission, and he gives honor to his wife. How much honor do we give to our wives? When do we give them the honor that they deserve and would strengthen our marriage and bless and encourage them? There used to be a couple that we would go and visit uh, often. Years ago, they would have us down to eat a lot of times to their home. And it was just um, sort of sickening <laughs> how much he bragged on his wife, you know? I mean, it was just, uh, she had the best biscuits you've ever seen and the best fried chickens ever been fried. And I mean, she keeps the best house, anybody, oh, I mean, it just make you sick. And she just, <laughs> he just went on and on and on, you know. And uh, it got a little old sometimes. But she would sit there, and she'd be beaming just like a, uh, you know, like a spring hen. She was just, she's soaking all that up. And they, they really had a, a good, uh, seemingly very good, wonderful relationship. I don't think we, including myself, uh, we certainly do not give our wives the honor that they should be given and appreciation and their job never ends. They're, remember Proverbs 31, her candle goeth not out by night. Old dad may be snoring over here in the bed, but mama's candle does not go out by night. Who is it we hollered for when we were young, when we were sick? Who was it we ran to when we were injured? Yeah, we all know the answer. And who do the football players on television always say? Hi, Mom, you know, it's, that's, uh, you know, their work is never done. Their, their gift and their love and their kindness should never be taken for granted. 
that they are in the role of submission and they want what's best for their home and family and they labor 24-7. Yeah, mm -hmm. give honor to the wife. That will help the marriage relationship as much as being in submission for the wife. And here's a beautiful thought. She is a weaker vessel because she's in submission. Not, I don't think he's talking about physical. I know usually men are physically stronger than women. But I think he's speaking here about this submission makes her a, a weaker vessel. And that, here's the thought, the beautiful thought of being heirs together of the grace of life. The grace of life. Help each other go to heaven. If you can convert this husband, then he can help you to go to heaven. And you can both work together like a team that your prayers be not hindered. It's hard to pray. I don't say it's impossible to pray if you're mad and angry and upset. If you're constantly fussing and fighting with each other in your home, you don't feel like praying. It's not an atmosphere of prayer. And so your prayers are hindered. Prayers are hindered by a failure of wives of insubmission and by husband failing to give honor to their wives. I hope the lesson has been a blessing as we've looked at some advice, advice from Simon Peter for husbands and wives. That we could be heirs together the grace of life. Help each other go to heaven. Is there anyone here today that needs to respond to the Lord's invitation because you have never obeyed the gospel? That's where it begins. That's how it begins. And it may have been, I don't know who's been the big influence upon your life, but someone that whose God-fearing example you followed and watched, and they've encouraged you to become a Christian. Or maybe you've become unfaithful and need to be restored to the Lord. That would be our hope and prayer, too, to get things right, that we can be heirs together of the grace of life. While we stand, while we sing.